Good morning and welcome. Uh, if you need tech support, please email us at milfamln.gmail.com for assistance. So we're going to go ahead and get started for today. My name is Coral Owen. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for the MFL, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session. This learning opportunity is brought to you by the Family Development Early Intervention Team of the MFLN. Webinar resources, including the presentation slides, can be found at learn.extension.org slash event slash 2942. These are located under event materials at the bottom of the page. And Misty has just posted this learn event page link to the chat pod. Thank you, Misty. Additionally, if you need a, a tech support during today's webinar, please email us at milfanln at gmail.com. This address, along with the link to the slides I just mentioned, is located and will remain in the important info pod to the lower right-hand corner of this page for your reference. The Military Families Learning Network is part of a DOD-USDA partnership for military families, connecting military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research and to each other through engaging online learning opportunities. You can explore more about our communities and resources at uh, militaryfamilies.eextension.org. I'd also like to let you know that you can join our MFLN webinar email list to receive our monthly updates by clicking on the link in the lower right of this slide. Finally, the MFLN is active on Facebook and Twitter, and we host an archive for our professional development sessions on YouTube, many of which are still uh, eligible for CE credit, so do check these out. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn things over to Robin DiPietro Wells with the Early Intervention Team. Thank you, Robin. Good morning. My name is Robin DiPietro Wells, and I'm the Social Media and Webinar Coordination Specialist for the MFLN Family Development Early Intervention Team. Our goal is to help support and enhance the skills of professionals serving military families who have young children with developmental delays and or disabilities. Today, we're very excited to have back with us Dr. Christy Preddy Frontzak. Christy received her master's and PhD in special education early intervention from the University of Oregon. From there, she spent 16 years as faculty at Kent State University, and she now trains and coaches early educators worldwide. Christy defines herself as a speaker, author, and researcher devoted to revolutionizing early childhood education. She seeks to cultivate real change within educational organizations by helping early educators transform practice. Right before I turn things over to Christy, I'm going to ask our audience to complete just a very quick poll for us. You'll notice a gray box that just popped up on your screen. If you could please click on your affiliation, keeping in mind that you might need to scroll all the way down a bit to find your correct category. So we'll give you just a couple minutes to uh, self-identify. Okay. All right, thank you. At this time, you might want to go get a pen and some paper to take notes as you follow along with today's presentation. Um, Coral mentioned that you can download the slides from today's presentation at the Learn event uh, website in the important info box at the bottom. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to mute my mic and turn it over to Christy. Great. Thank you, Robin, and thank you, Coral, and hi, everyone. I'm super glad to have you with us today. So we're going to talk about play some more. So some of you have been on the previous webinars, or some of you might go back and listen to the two previous ones. Um, but there's a lot about play that um, needs our attention, especially this day and age where we tend to focus on rushing development, uh, accountability and compliance, and uh, standardization over personalization. So today we're going to talk a little bit about this uh, balance between being very intentional with the purpose of play but also being very playful during play. So we have a couple of objectives um, that I'll kind of walk you through in case this is a little hard to see. But um, basically it's to really understand um, that paradox that I mentioned uh, that how can you have both? How can you have intentional instruction and how can you be playful? And just keep in mind that when I talk about the word 
teach or instruction. I don't mean a classroom or a teacher with a license. I mean those of us who are adults and that we are um, forming relationships and interacting with young children and building their brains. So we might use words like intentional instruction or teach or even outcomes that might sound very much like, hey, I'm not a teacher. I'm a coach or a developmental specialist or a mom. And so what does this have to do with me? But if we are an adult and we are in the lives of young children, then we are really there to be purposeful in helping grow that little human being. So we're going to talk about what does it mean to be intentional and playful? How do we do this during everyday activities and routines? I'll talk about teaching academic and social skills. And again, that sounds very much like public school education in the United States, but it's really about whole child. How are we developing all the body parts and how are we really supporting all areas of development and learning? And then lastly, how do we really be a strong play partner? Um, how do we not sort of succumb to all the pressures to get kids ready for kindergarten or even just the pressures of daily life just to trudge through it? Um, but how do we stop and really see ourselves as a strong play partner? How do we support other adults to be strong play partners? Um, and how do we do that when children have sort of um, more complex ways of interacting? And we'll, we'll talk more about kids who are kind of struggling in our fourth webinar. So if you stick with me, we'll go there. Um, there's going to be lots of opportunities today to stop and chat. Um, as Robin mentioned, you might want to have something to write with because we're going to give you tons and tons of things uh, to look at, not right now, but down the road. So what I really want you to be doing is as I throw ideas at you and as people post to the chat, I want you to really think about what's at least one takeaway that I can put into my practice. So it'll, you'll kind of, you know, space off and you'll be thinking about and checking your email and then somebody will come in your office and maybe you're driving and hopefully you're paying attention to that and you'll get to the visit that you need to make later today. But all of that's just kind of all this noise. So how can you take just a minute and think, what do I really want to get out of today? What's one thing that I can um, put into my practice? And so if you're a trainer, if you're a coach, if you're a parent, if you're a teacher, if you're a developmental specialist, if you're a therapist, it doesn't matter what our role is. Part of what we need to do is that we need to think about how do we change the mindset of ourselves and or maybe those that we hang out with. So if you, you're like, what do you mean by mindset? Well, one of my mantras is mindset before methods. So some of you are like, nope, let's get right in. Give me the tools. I need to fill up my toolkit. I need more ideas, more strategies. I've got this kid that's really difficult. I have a family I'm really struggling with. I personally am really struggling, wherever it might be that you're facing resistance. And so we seek out more and more tips and ideas. But I'm going to argue that before we can have more methods, more ideas, more strategies, we really have to think about our mindset. And that's our tendencies, our habits, our values, our dispositions. And this is going to be really important as we move forward today, because what is your mindset around play? Do you really value play? Do you really value slowing down and allowing for rough and tumble play? Do you get nervous if, um, you know, kids are going to want to play out things that they see, and especially kids living in military families, they're going to see things that maybe are more towards aggression or violence, not meaning there's a judgment there, but just meaning that that's the reality of the sacrifice that our military families are making on our behalf. So when we think about our mindset, we need to think about our mindset around play, and then where do we hear shark music? Where do we start to get worried that it's going to get too rambunctious, that it's going to get out of control, that it's going to go in a direction uh, that's not productive? Um, and then how do we face that resistance when we're working with families who may have a different 
mindset around play. And so have we had a conversation with the families that we have the honor of serving about what they value, what their tendencies are, even just personally towards play. You might have uh, a parent who's an introvert raising an extrovert, and that will cause so much shark music because that doesn't feel good, that match between the child and the parent. So we're going to just dig into mindset, and I'm going to give you a few strategies out of the gate um, that will help you work on your mindset. And if you want and it helps you, keep, you stay engaged, use the chat. Like share out what do you what is your mindset? Do you love play? Do you value play? Is play valued in your community? How do you promote play in your community and in your family? If you were on the very first webinar, you may remember that I challenged you to set a play date for yourself. I had you open up your calendars and set a date in the future where you would do something that was joyful to you, something that was um, brought you happiness and brought you back to this notion of being playful. I feel like you could do that again, um, but feel free to talk about where's your mindset and where do you face resistance. It could be, uh, for those of you who work in an educational system, all the pressure that we have from K-12 uh, to get kids ready. It could be that families um, that you serve are really transitional, very mobile, and so there's not a lot of time to think about play when you're just trying to pay bills and uh, take the next breath to survive, right? So just take a minute and think about um, what is your approach, what is your mindset towards play? And the two strategies we're going to give you out of the gate, even though we're still on mindset before method, um, and we've shared them before, but they're worth sharing again, is that uh, the power of play. And so if families struggle with knowing how to play, if it doesn't come naturally to them, um, sometimes we can use their left hemisphere and we can say, let's just explore why play is so powerful. Not in a way that makes them feel more anxious because they can't do it, but they can start to see that, wow, Wow, just interacting with the environment, um, just inviting the kids uh, in the apartment next door over, just by um, inviting a child to kind of go into self-directed play, there's value in all of that. So it doesn't have to be that I as the adult have to be doing something all the time. So it could be for people who struggle with, well, what is play and why is it valuable and I don't know what to do, maybe looking at this infographic just to understand how it's so powerful and how it unfolds in development that even just being responsive to a baby who's crying is play. It's that interaction between us as humans in those very early years. So I invite you to check out, and Robin has put the link to our infographic on the power of play. You can certainly share this with others. It might be even a catalyst for a discussion on your next home visit with a family and say, let's just walk through this together and see, you know, which of these things are part of our your culture, either broadly your culture, your family's culture, your individual preferences. So that's your first idea. And it just kind of walks through kind of how play is so impactful in the early years. The second way that you can get um, sort of your mindset uh, in the right place around the power of play is our ebook around the power of play. And so I use this phrase called, do you really Peter Pan believe? Do you really truly believe or do you give it lip service? And so even if you look at your own families and if you think about your morning routine, and again, this is not meant to be judgmental because most of the time I can barely take care of myself, let alone um, a group of children. But did you rush through your routine? Did you um, struggle to get everybody where they were supposed to be on time and there wasn't a lot of opportunity to really think about being playful in that flow, in that routine. So again, these are just meant as conversation starters because as Plato said, you can just discover more about a person in an hour of play than a year in conversation. And this doesn't mean that it has to be all rambunctious. It doesn't have to be something that's outside people's comfort zone. But we need to really have a mindset that play is um, very powerful. And so how do we get there? How do we start to change our mindset? Um, we might be doing okay, but if we're supporting other adults, 
if we're working in an agency that may not value these things, how do we sort of shift that mindset? So the rest of the webinar coming up will be how do we uh, create embedded learning opportunities? How do we really teach during play? How do we help support um, development and learning of young children? But again, we're right now, we're thinking about our mindset before our methods. And so our mindset is what is my value? What is my tendency towards play? And so we gave you two things to explore that, either through your own reflection or with others, uh, those on your staff, those that are your colleagues, those families that you support. And that's the infographic on the power of play and the power of play ebook that has tons of inspirational quotes. The next two strategies, remember I told you I was going to give you tons of things that would be too big to explore while I'm talking at you, but are things I want you to write a little note that says, I totally want to get that. I want to download it. I want to share it. I want to post it on our blog. I want to put it in our next newsletter. Any of those things, I want you to make sure you're making that quick note. But let's talk about what do you do when you're sort of facing some of that resistance or you've decided that you'd like to change your mindset or as a collective you've decided you'd like to change your mindset. So two more resources. One is going to be about a framework for guiding self-reflection. Again, I hate to give this because I know people are so busy and there's not a time for this. Um, but I hope that you will carve out even a little time each month. If you could get down to each week, that would be fabulous, where you can just reflect for a minute, whether that's the next time you're at a stop sign or stoplight instead of checking your phone. Just take a deep breath and go, ha, huh, how did that home visit go? How are we doing on using play as the sort of catalyst for learning? There's this podcast that I did with my colleague, Laura Fish, from California. And so if you are finding yourselves often in an airport or on the go, and um, maybe you're on the treadmill and you don't want to be there, but you're trying to do that in your life as well, stick this little podcast in your earbuds. And it's podcast 21 from our pre-K teach and play episode. And we talk about how we sort of really get to um, teaching with the brain and mind, through self-reflection, and we give a step-by-step um, -step way that you can engage in self-reflection. So there's a whole downloadable and a way to really, a um, little framework to shape self-reflection and or to guide the reflection of those you work with. So that's another little quick tip. Um, and then the one that's a little lighter maybe is our um, Mindful Inquiry Starter Pack. And again, you can download this for free as well. These are just little questions that another friend of mine, uh, Myra Parata, and I developed that are just questions you can ask yourself. Uh, you can encourage families to ask themselves, colleagues to ask themselves, um, that just sort of allow you to engage in self-reflection, which is sort of our first step to changing um, our mindset and getting to this place where we really can embrace play. And one of the prompts is what? fun thing can I do today? So maybe that's your takeaway. Maybe that's what you do um, with all of these ramblings and resources that I'm sharing with you. Maybe you just answer this one self-reflective question. What fun thing can I do today? And you get to define fun, right? It's not for me to decide what you think is fun. And so that might be a fabulous um, place to begin with your self-reflection in shifting your mindset to be um, really embracing the power of play. So there you go. That was like fast and furious kind of getting into your uh, mind. But now we're ready to dig into our methods. And remember, you can use the chat as a way to sort of have some external accountability that says, I'm going to look at this infographic. I'm going to listen to this podcast. I'm going to really take a minute at the next stoplight and take a breath, right? Those are fabulous things for you to be noting, and I love it when you share it in the chat because it helps me know kind of what's landing on you or even what's a barrier. Like, I just don't know how that's possible because now we're going to actually get into some methods about how to support 
children during play. But again, it's hard to support children during play and to create learning opportunities during play if we don't really create play in the first place, right? So it's hard to embed in a place that is non-existent. So always think about the different hats that you wear. So it could be your own family, it could be the families that you serve, it could be the students that you're training that are going to then serve families, right? We have a whole variety of people here today. So be thinking about um, which of these methods um, am I ready to put into action? And so I'm going to give you two phrases, and I would love to know if you've heard about them before, if you have um, an, your own working definition of what they mean, and those phrases are embedded learning opportunities. That's the first one. We sometimes call it an ELO. You know how we have to give an acronym to everything. Embedded learning opportunities, which is a component of another phrase called activity-based intervention, or ABI. So Robin has put those two phrases, activity-based learning or activity-based intervention, and embedded learning opportunities. Have you heard them before? You could just say yes, no. If you just want to make up what you think they mean, that would be great as well. Like they're kind of funny words, but what does it mean to be activity-based? What does it mean to embed learning? So I'm just going to keep talking a little bit and let people say, yep, I've heard about them. Yes, we've studied them. Yes, we embrace them. Or no, this is a new idea. This is a new um, concept. And you can share synonyms as well. It's kind of um, what, yeah, like what it reminds you of or what you've heard others equate it to. All right, good, 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 good connections there that people are making. And, and what we're going to do is you're typing, one of the first things we're going to do is talk about how easy it is and how hard it is all at the same time. So when we think about everyday routines, um, I may have shared with some of you before, I just always cringe at some of my early days as a home visitor because I just embraced this idea of embedding an activity-based intervention so literally that I didn't take time to think about that maybe not every daily routine was a good opportunity. So I might say, sure, you could have done that in your morning routine this morning. You're like, Christy, you're just lucky that we got shoes on feet and nobody got hurt, right? Like that's our criteria for getting out the door this morning. But yet if I was your home visitor and I said, wow, the, door, you know, the morning routine creates such a wonderful opportunity for you to do X, Y, and Z, you might just look at me like I fell, off, uh, fell out of a tree, right? So yeah, definitely like diaper changing time and, and times that we eat and transitions and travel and even when we're watching TV or having a bath or getting ready for bed. Yep, these are all daily routines, but not all of them are conducive to learning and to supporting. So we really have to pay attention to the nuances behind how to create a good embedded learning opportunity. So the end result is we want to support children's learning and development. Children cohabitate within families, so essentially we're, we're supporting families to create embedded learning opportunities. If children are in child care or if they happen to be in um, some sort of formal or group education, then we might be supporting or we might be the person that's creating these embedded learning opportunities. So one example could just be as, quite as simple as when children are getting ready for bed, a parent might ask their kids, what do we do first? You're like, well, that's not very fancy. I asked that a hundred million times because my kids are always doing the wrong thing in the wrong order, right? But just by asking, what do we do before we get into bed creates an embedded learning opportunity. I'll come back to why that is. Another one that's just quite so simple is describing what child is doing. So here's a little kid playing in the water in the sand. And so a parent might say, it looks like you're filling and dumping your bucket with water. And you're like, okay, Christy, so um, that's not so fancy. Then you can say, well, it really was. It was intentional. It targeted a meaningful act outcome, and it was just the daily event, the daily interaction. 
And you're like, well, so if it's that easy, I just say the things I always say, or I invite parents to ask questions or describe their kids' actions. Why do we need a whole webinar on it? Why do we need all of this dedication and books on the topic of creating intentional embedded learning opportunities? Well, even though it seems so logical and it seems like it's so much a part of what we could or do do, it's actually kind of a challenge. So before I tell you the research and the experiences I've had, since so many of you have heard the phrase embedded learning opportunities or activity-based intervention, you kind of um, uh, alluded to it, but what barriers have you faced? Um, what do you sort of anticipate that you will face? Is there resistance? Is there something that gets lost in translation as you try to help others create embedded learning opportunities? So if you can, just use the chat for a second and share with us a barrier, a challenge. Again, I don't mean to drag you down into the negative parts, but it's good to sometimes kind of admire the problem a bit and figure out why we get stuck, and then we can get unstuck together. So what what barriers, what challenges, what confusions, what questions do you have about how you might do embedded learning opportunity more efficiently? And so I'm just going to take a pause and read the chat as well so that we can pull out some things. So what should we focus on, right? So is it okay to focus on soft skills or is this all about teaching colors, shapes, and size? Um, Perfect. Sibling interactions, right? What, do, what are we doing to promote positive relationships between siblings that might have um, some sort of difficult interactions? Time, of course, right? How do we um, use our time efficiently? How do we not worry about the product but value the process? Yeah, I, I agree. Sometimes some of these things that come so naturally to us, it's hard to figure out why it doesn't come naturally to others. Then we have the challenge of parents who may um, be cognitively delayed in some way themselves, or they may have so much shark music that it's hard to be involved. We've got that uh, digital device that is increasingly in the way and in between us doing relationships. Okay, good. Yeah, daycares and uh, other group care can be also a challenge. Um, we may not have much say over the interaction. Um, and then uh, definitely that idea of that mindset of what is therapy versus education versus interaction. And so um, when people feel set in their ways, how do we encourage and invite them to see things in a different way? So, um, ah, thanks, Sam. Let me explain. Shark music is another one of my phrases uh, that it's, uh, if you think of the Jaws movie, if you've ever seen Jaws back in the day, where you would hear um, impending doom. So the theme to Jaws goes like dun dun, dun dun, dun dun, dun dun, right? It gets louder and more uh, vigorous, and we get more and more panicked, and our shoulders are now up by our ears, and we can barely breathe because we're so ah. That's hearing shark music. So sometimes um, when we can become aware of what causes us shark music and families can identify their shark music, we can figure out a way to turn it down and then we can start to change and get to a change in practice or fidelity. So whenever you hear resistance or people are set in their ways and people don't want to change and people like it the way they're doing it, it's often because if they do it differently, they hear shark music. So if we can step back, back to that mindset before a method, instead of saying, no, you need to try this, you should do this, this is better, don't get too frustrated, don't get them frustrated, maybe have that conversation about why are you feeling stuck? Um, what shark music do you hear? And you can use that analogy of, you know, what makes you kind of go blinded by fear or anxiety or frustration. 
So what my research and experience has shown me that we get stuck in three places when we think about creating embedded learning opportunities during play. You guys have mentioned those in one way or another, but let me see if I can sort of put them into three buckets. Then we're going to let them just sit in those buckets. We're going to get back into some strategies, and then we'll come back to those buckets and see if we can sort of address each one systematically. So the first challenge that the research and our experiences have shown us is that we start to move into delivering therapies or instructions or suggested ideas before we have a strong relationship. So that could be before I have a relationship with the family that I serve. That could be before the family has a strong relationship with their child. Now, this can get really um, oh, difficult in many ways, and we're going to come back to how do we address relationships. Um, relationships are so necessary, but we sort of gloss over them. We sort of feel like this is the touchy-feely stuff. This is the stuff that we shouldn't have to like think about. It just happens. But in, in fact, we really need to pay attention. And one of the things, and Robin shared some statistics with me that I was unaware of, um, that the statistics of that military families um, sort of understanding or recognizing or even just their perception about whether or not civilians understand their lives, right? Understand the sacrifices, understand the challenges that they face there was like up in like the 90% of families, military families saying that they don't believe that the rest of the world understands their position, understands their sacrifices, understands their challenges. And that sort of breaks my heart in so many ways, but it can be extrapolated to probably most of us as human beings. Most of us probably feel like people don't quite understand our unique circumstances our unique situation, our unique um, background and culture. So I just kind of wanted to not to diminish the concern that military families have that we, uh, that civilians and others sort of uh, come to realize the challenges and the sacrifices, but it's sort of this broader perspective that we too quickly uh, forget that we need to spend time letting people know that we've heard them and that we can recognize that they have their own perspective or way. And so we're going to come back to that in a little bit. The other reason that we struggle with embedded learning opportunities is that we may not target meaningful outcomes. Many of you target, you said this a little bit about what is the outcome for therapy? Uh, what is the academic skill that a child is supposed to do? We're not valuing process over the actual product of the skill itself. So I'll give you some strategies about how to think about um, this notion of what is the outcome. And so what is what is important today may be different than what is important tomorrow. And so in particular, any of you who have families that you're serving on an IFSP or an IEP, an Individualized Family Service Plan, or an IEP, an Individualized Education Plan, you might need to be thinking about, sure, we have regular intervals when we revisit our outcomes, but really, each time we talk with a family, each time we work with a child care provider, we need to be thinking about, do we need to change our outcomes? Has something changed in the life of this family? And especially for our military families, when they're moving through cycles of deployment, redeployment, even coming from um, some sort of leave or hospitalization, um, all of those things are transitions that may change the priorities. So we want to think about what is important um, that we target as an outcome. And that's a really fluid question. The last one is that when we're being a good play partner, we really want to think about how do we be a guide on the side versus a sage on the stage. Now, this can happen in two ways. When I'm directly working with a child, interacting with a child, and playing with a child, I have to think about how am I guiding and supporting versus leading and directing. This can also be in my work with adults 
So when I'm working with adults, it's not my job to tell. It's my job to ask and support, to be that guide on the side, not the sage on the stage. So those sort of three challenges are what the research shows us and our experiences tell us that we might struggle with this very easy nuance of creating these embedded learning opportunities during play. Because remember, let's go all the way back to the beginning. We want to support children's development and their learning. And we do that by changing our mindset before picking up another method. And at least one of our mindsets has to be that we value play as the context for where learning and development occurs. Then we know that we're going to have resistance. So how do we support and guide others to see um, the importance of play? And then when we think about, OK, got it. I want to use play as my vehicle. How do I do that? We go, ah, we create embedded learning opportunities. We might instantly face these three challenges. A, we haven't thought enough about relationships. B, we haven't thought enough or often enough about meaningful outcomes. And then thirdly, we haven't seen our role enough as the guide versus the sage. So those sort of challenges are there with us. And they're going to be, no matter what the routine activity is, no matter what the age of the child is, no matter what the um, circumstances of the family is, we really need to sort of find some solutions that help us overcome these challenges. So I'm going to switch us now to kind of bringing all of this together and going even deeper into some strategies that you can use um, to overcome the challenges. I'm going to give you some strategies um, that we talk about in terms of really creating these intentional embedded learning opportunities. And then I'm going to give you some ideas to overcome each of the specific challenges that I mentioned, the relationships, the meaningful outcomes, and the idea that we just left on um, back here about being the guide on the side. So remember, your task today is to find one thing at least, one little nugget. And maybe that's that idea of shark music. Maybe that's your takeaway, right? Maybe it's that question about zest. What's one thing that you can do that's fun today? So don't worry, because I'm just like nonstop talking at you. Um, but I want you to be able to have some time to really go, wow, I got one good thing out of today. That's good enough. There's one thing that I can put into practice right away. So here's kind of maybe three more ideas of things that you can um, put into practice right away. Um, I don't know, you might end up with like 20 at the end of the webinar. So I hope you're taking notes or having an opportunity to process in between my uh, comments. So the first thing you see on the slide if you aren't driving or uh, walking about is this idea of um, the game Clue. Um, so some of you might have played this game when you were growing up or played it with your kids, but it's this idea of like Professor Plum in the library with the candlestick. It's this idea that when we create an embedded learning opportunity, we know all the pieces and the parts and we know how they all go together. And so this is really important when we think about, again, about our military families. If we don't know all the situational information, if we don't know if it's anything about deployment, if they're returning or relocation, if there's things about combat stress, if we, don't, if we aren't aware of these things, it's hard for us to play detective and bring it all together. So I invite people to really take that analogy of clue and think about all of the situational information. So when I'm going to design an embedded learning opportunity, there's multiple variables I need to be considering, and I need to be really thinking about them all going on at the same time. The second image is one of a crystal ball. And the reason I put the crystal ball is because we're always planning for the future, but we're making assumptions about you know, sort of where we should go next. And the whole idea of a good embedded learning opportunity is creating this match. It's this idea of knowing this is right for you right now under these circumstances. And so 
that word match is going to come up several times as we move forward. So if you want to make a note on your paper or in your mind, how do you create a match? If you're finding some resistance or kids aren't making progress or families uh, don't really see what you see, it might be that you have a mismatch versus a match. Remember back to that idea of I can give you a suggestion of how to create an embedded learning opportunity for any situation ever, right? Morning routine, brushing your teeth, riding on the subway, watching TV, going to the grocery store. I can create an embedded learning opportunity for any of those. But if I don't create a match, both for the situation that the family is in and for the child's development, it sort of doesn't matter. So we're going to try to always create this match. And then that becomes this last part or this last image that it's a balance. It's a balancing act. And it's really this balance between being very intentional, creating the plan, creating this sort of what we'll teach, when we'll teach, where we'll teach, and then also being ready to follow the family's lead and being able to follow the child's lead. Because, you know, so many of us have had the best intentions and then we get to that home visit and everything has changed. The family's uh, in crisis or just things have changed so remarkably that our best plan is no longer the best plan. So this is sort of just a way to think about um, creating good embedded learning opportunities is to think of all the variables at play, think about creating a match by looking uh, where the child's going but also where they are, and then creating this sort of balancing act between planning and being intentional but being able to follow children's lead. So I'm going to be kind of straightforward and I'm going to give you five steps and that might be very linear and some of you are like, oh, thank you. I need some left hemisphere work for a minute. This has been too verbal, too kind of like out there. I got to see it. I got to know what is this first, second, third idea. And so I'm going to show it to you kind of linearly, and then we're going to talk about it in that more fluid way because we always need to create that match, okay? So we're going to really think about that there are five components. Remember I told you there's all these situational variables. There's all these things I need to think about. And so we're going to think about knowing five things. So to create an embedded learning opportunity, you need to consider five pieces. For those of you who like to bake, think of these as five ingredients. For those of you who like to do puzzles, think about a puzzle with five pieces. For those of you who like step-by-step -step directions, think about this as first, second, third, fourth, fifth, okay? However you like to think of it, if I said to you, go create an embedded learning opportunity, you would go, oh, okay, first I have to, and the very first is to know what you're teaching, know when you're teaching, know where, with what, and how. Now, before you kind of shut down and go, wait, teaching, I'm not a teacher, that's not my job. If you can, or if you were on the very beginning of the webinar, remember, I'm using that word teach very, very broadly. All of us who work and interface with young children are teachers. All of us, when we model, even if that's when I'm walking through the airport and I try to model some degree of self-regulation, right, even though I hear lots of shark music, when I'm modeling self-regulation or kindness or I say something to a child. I was on a walk around the lake yesterday uh, here in Evergreen, Colorado, and um, a little kid just says, hi, and I said hi back to him. Well, that was an embedded learning opportunity. That was an opportunity for me to model, not my kid, I'm not his teacher, but I am interacting with children. So don't feel like teach is a narrow word. It's a very expansive word where we're supporting the development and learning of a little human being. But we got five things that we're going to walk through. What, when, where, with what, and how. After I kind of break down each of those five parts of an embedded learning opportunity, I'm then going to give you strategies that will help you create these with some amount of ease and grace. Okay, so here we go. The first one is one that I could stay on forever, but I won't because we only have so much time together. 
but this is the idea of knowing what are you teaching. So if you have an IFSP or an IEP, an Individualized Family Service Plan or an Individualized Education Plan, many times your what is defined on there. But I'm going to give you kind of three ways to think about what we are teaching children. First what are common outcomes. This is knowing development. And for me, this is where we could all spend a little bit more time. When you find that families may have quote unquote unrealistic expectations, when you feel like I want to roll my eyes, when you feel like families just don't get it, right? When you say these things that are showing a divide between where you are and where families are, maybe take a step back and say, hmm, maybe we haven't taught or talked about development. Maybe we haven't had a conversation about what we know about how children develop from the inside out, from the brain stem up and forward, from gross motor to fine motor, from being externally regulated to being internally regulated. How we have these conversations. So don't assume that everybody knows development. Also don't assume that the milestones and the expectations that are sort of purported on Google or in our kindergarten readiness checklist are really developmentally appropriate. So we need to have these really good conversations about what is it that we expect all young children to be learning. The second kind of outcome or what to teach is, huh, I see a little kid who's struggling or where development has stalled. We want to peel back away from that common outcome and start to understand why are they struggling? Why has their development stalled? Not just teach louder, longer, right? So a friend of mine in Canada said once, if you have to repeat yourself, the child is not the slow learner. So I'll say that again. So if you have to repeat yourself, the child is not the slow learner. So this idea of a targeted outcome is when a child is struggling or development has stalled. The last kind of outcome is this very individualized one. And this is often where we find ourselves when we think about an IFSP or IEP. It's very personalized. It's data-driven. It's based upon the unique needs that this child has within the context of their family. But all I want you to take away from this point is, are you and your team clear about what it is that is being taught? It's impossible to create an embedded learning opportunity without starting with your what. The next one, which I'll go a little bit more quickly on that, is when. Now, when you think about when, you're going to automatically think about the daily routine. But I want you to think about time as a really weird construct. So for me, in this webinar, time is going by very quickly. For you all, time is probably eking along, right? So Hopefully it's not. Hopefully you feel really engaged and you're getting a couple of good ideas and it feels like it's a good match. So that would help time pass quickly. Time also has to do with our habits and our daily routines. But each of us has a different routine. For example, I'm staying with some friends here in Colorado and they have a different routine than my daily routine. And even within their family unit, they have different routines. And so when we think about um, serving families, especially families that may be uh, in the military where they don't have say over their routine or their routine changes from minute to minute, day to day, week to week, situation by situation. We can't always know that the win is the perfect win. We may have to revisit this often or the win for one caregiver is a different win for another caregiver. So just want to invite a big conversation that we don't quickly assume that we know when is a good time to teach. Children will also help us decide when because they have to be ready. This takes us to the where, which is sort of like um, if I'm going to be uh, teaching uh, something that's in the bedroom, in the hallway, in the car, on the playground, in large group, at circle time, it's just being clear about where it's most likely to occur. So if it's something to do with eating, of course the where is 
Oh, right. We don't know, right? Most of us eat in the car in front of the TV. How many of you have eaten at a table lately, right? Um, so when we think about where, it's not always the same place as it would be for our family. So we have to have this conversation about where is the best place to deliver the embedded learning opportunity, and then what are the materials, what things do we need. Um, I know for many of you who our home visitors, we have this debate often about whether or not we should bring toys into families' homes. And without getting into that um, sort of idea of whether or not we should, it's just about what are the materials that are going to be there or need to be there to support an opportunity for the child to practice the what within the context of that daily routine and play. And then that brings us to step five, which is the how will I teach? Do we know the actual steps we will take? And if we're supporting families, have we made those steps clear enough? It's crystal clear in our mind. We might use a lot of jargon. We might model it a couple times and go, there, that's how you do it. And then the family's like, mm, uh, I'm sure I should have gotten that after the fifth time you demonstrated it, but I still don't quite get it. So how do we make sure that we're really clear about how to do it, and then give enough support to other adults that they can deliver it. So here we go. Let's have a minute to pause before I give you some strategies to put these five into action. But as you heard me go pretty quickly through what to teach, when to teach, where to teach, with what to teach, and especially for those of you who love loose parts and you have this great knack of finding anything in the environment that can help support your therapy and your intervention, um, and then how to teach. Which one would you say um, is natural to you, that you feel very confident, that you're sure that you are um, pretty clear about and that you have good conversations around? So. So Emily, tell me a little bit more. When you think about doing routines-based interviewing, are you saying that really helps you with these five things? It may not be said in the same way, but it helps you think about the when and the where and the who, who's going to be there. And how about others? Have you thought about in particular, I'll put it back on that slide for those of you who are seeing it, and for those of you who are watching this after the fact, be thinking about which of these are you really clear about? Which one are you... Um, not so clear about. And in particular, if you kind of go back to even the what, have you had conversations with people about development in a way that helps you know the difference between a common expectation, why a child might be struggling, can you peel it back? And then have you really found those foundational prerequisites that are the personalized things? And so just as we think about these routines-based interviews in particular, this is going to be a great segue in a minute when we talk about have we spent enough time with relationships because we need to make sure that people feel very comfortable, like Robin was sharing about how her family, um, what, they, what their dinner time routine looks like. And Robin has this amazing way to be very open and like assured that this is how our family does it. You can like it or you don't have to like it. Not all families will feel so secure in their decisions, and they may feel that we may judge them, that we may think poorly of them, that we may um, think that they're not doing well. So we need to make sure that we have that relationship so that when we ask families these very sensitive questions, or what could be sensitive, we don't cause that shark music. Okay, so if you're holding those five things in your mind, and they're making some sort of sense, that, that these are the five ways that we think about starting to create an embedded learning opportunity. So whether you like to think of it as the ingredients to a recipe, if you like to think about it as pieces of your puzzle, or just step one, two, three, four, five, I'm going to show you a way that you can put these five into action. And we call these power packs. And feel free to keep posting to the chat. I'm able to kind of read those, and I'll incorporate some of your comments going forward. And then Robin will also be sharing more links in the coming slides around where you can learn more about these power packs. We have a printable version, 
or printable version, and then we have an app, and then we actually have a printable version of the app. So there's sort of three things I'm going to walk you through. This particular power pack is um, focused mostly around this broad outcome of self-regulation. So remember, you need to know what you're teaching before you worry about the when and the where and the why and the how and all that good stuff. And sometimes I feel like even with routines-based interviewing, we can get a lot of irrelevant information or a lot of sensitive information, but we're really not being clear with families about why we need that information. Sometimes if we can start with what are we trying to support this child to learn, then we can better understand how a family's routines are there to provide embedded learning opportunities. So let's talk about um, these power packs. And so one way that we do them um, in a printable format, I'm actually going to show you the printable format, and then I'll come back to the stories. Um, you know, reading is such an important uh, skill set. So is oral storytelling. So don't get too caught up in that we all have to be English-speaking people that are literate. It can be absolutely in the native language or the preferred language of families, and it can absolutely be storytelling through um, sort of oral traditions versus just reading. But I'm going to show you um, some ways to do this with books. But first, you'll see five columns if you're looking at your screen, or if you're not, just imagine those five pieces of an embedded learning opportunities in step one, two, three, four, five in a column. And so you can actually create these with families, um, and these can be refrigerator reminders. These can be things that child care providers can put in the inside of a book or the inside of a tub or on the outside of a water table. Um, it could even be in a, if a child has a trunk of toys. It could be on the lid of the trunk so that there are these little reminders about how to deliver an ELO within the context of play. Several of you mentioned earlier in the chat that some families might not know what their role is, how to be playful, what should they say, what would they do. And so this little sheet is sort of a cheat sheet um, that helps families know what to say, when to say it, where to say it, the materials to have, and then they know what they're teaching. So this is another way to think of an ELO is by having what to teach, always starting there, when, where, with what, and then how. And so in the link that Robin has provided for the uh, webinar today, we've given you several that you can print off and reuse, as well as a link to my website where we have even more. Um, we've written these for three books. These are um, one book you probably know, two are just my favorite, so I have to share them with you. So what we do is we say, okay, what is it that I'm teaching? So let's say that the story is The Very Hungry Caterpillar. And, you know, we've all read that book probably too many times in our lives, right? Um, so if that's a familiar book to you, we start with what are we teaching? So in The Hungry Caterpillar, we might teach things like um, the relationships or associations. So how are things related to one another? And then when we think about uh, things that are, um, oh, bigger than, smaller than, this is that way to show how things are connected or have a relationship. If we Think about Soul Friends. This is a book that my friend Myra wrote that in Soul Friends, we could be teaching about things like appreciation and kindness and love and trust. And you're like, ooh, this sounds like a lot of soft skill stuff. Yep, really, really important. And, you know, for those of us on this globe uh, in the past, what, 75, 90 days have seen so many events where we need more of this idea of kindness and love. And so how do we intentionally create learning opportunities to teach kids these skills, especially if it's not always so um, easy to us? And then the last one is from my friend uh, Andrew Newman. Um, 
his books for the Conscious Bedtime Story Club. One of the books is The Elephant Who Tried to Tiptoe. And in this book, we're teaching about self-regulation and labeling. And so we always start with the what. And so as you have a chance to look at those, and again, that might be something that you put on your little list or that if you are watching this after the fact, hit pause, go directly to the handouts for today and scroll down till you see the printable power packs for stories and look at them and go, ah, I see what is being taught. When story time, bedtime, nap time, rest time, uh, travel time, whenever you might have, maybe you've been just waiting for your dinner at a restaurant, so or you're pushing a child through the grocery store and they are holding a book, fabulous. That's your win. Where are you? Oh, we're at Target. We're at um, McDonald's. We're at our house. And then what do I teach with? Super easy. It's the book, right? It's the elephant who tried to tiptoe. It's the um, very hungry caterpillar. So it's very simple. It's just the book. And then how do I teach it? And so we use these evidence-based strategies about self-talk, parallel talk, asking questions, modeling, brainstorming, and we write a little script. So this can actually lead to fidelity of implementation. Any of you who've ever gotten, tried to get another adult to do something, you always tell me, I can't get to fidelity. I can't get them to do the therapy, the intervention. So this is like a little treatment plan that tells them exactly what to say, exactly where to say it, when to say it, and then we don't have to worry about what we're teaching. And that what can be an IFSP outcome, it can be something a child is struggling with. It could be something that um, all children need to be learning, which could be like self-regulation, emotional, uh, how to label your emotions, uh, impulse control, um, joint attention, all these lovely things that we just so want kids to have, right? So this is called a power pack. These are the printable ones, but again, all it is are those same five components of embedded learning opportunity. So if we kind of spiral all the way back, the purpose of this webinar is to really think about being intentional during play. And so I hope that you can see that by teaching self-regulation, you know, during um, our bedtime routine, while we're in my child's bedroom, with the story, the elephant who tried to tiptoe, and if I say or do these certain things, I will have created this fabulous little beautiful embedded learning opportunity. We'll come back to those challenges, so don't forget that, that they are still there, but we're going to come back. And so I see people are talking about how they can maybe um, coach or um, model or practice these things with families and or co-create them with families so that they pick the stories that they're comfortable with, that they pick the times of day that make sense to them. And then certainly the how to teach um, could be done collaboratively, but it might also really be where your expertise comes in. So let's look at the app version quickly. And again, this is something I'm going to show you screenshots of. It's a free educational app that you can download. Um, and Robin will share the link where you can download it. Right now it's available on um, iTunes uh, in the Apple Store. Sorry, if you have an iPhone smartphone that uses uh, the Apple Store apps. And it's also on Google Play. Uh, but in a minute, I'll show you printable versions that come from the app so that if you A, don't want more screen time, or B, don't um, have an app, a phone, a smartphone, or device, you can't download these on your laptop. It's very much for a mobile device because it's an app. So when you go to pre-k, teachandplay.com forward slash power packs, that's where you can click on the icon for the App Store or the Google Play. Um, so the first one that we shared were what we call printable power packs that are based on reading stories and different outcomes, but the, the with what, if you will, is the story. Then we have a power pack that is an app that is specific to teaching self-regulation, taking the perspective of others, impulse control, 
focused attention, getting, keeping, shifting attention, problem solving, recall, all that fabulous stuff that falls under the umbrella of self-regulation. And so inside the educational app that is really just a, like 140 some embedded learning opportunities, there are four categories, three levels, and then three types of strategies. So let me break that down. The four categories are really Really, this idea, I'll show you an example here in a minute, um, of days, of, of parts of the routine. So when we think about the win part of the ELO, the categories kind of classify, are you kind of doing things that are um, daily living skills? Are you kind of doing things that are um, exploring your environment? Are you kind of doing things that are kind of like language and literacy? So those four categories are kind of your win. The three levels are kind of your what. So even though it's all about self-regulation across the entire educational app, there are three levels of difficulty. So level one is very early what in terms of self-regulation. Level two, you're getting a little bit harder. Level three, you're getting a little bit better at your self-regulation. And then the three strategies that we use are the how. So when you look at these um, on your screen, all it is on your mobile device screen, as well as maybe your screen here, is a little prompt of what to say or do. And when you say or do this, you will have created an embedded learning opportunity. So this one here happens to be a level three. So it's a higher level of self-regulation. It's using the teaching strategy or the how of self talk and it's while the child is kind of exploring their environment so you're starting to see that what when where with what and how the with what is not told to you in the app because it's trying to be open-ended enough that no matter what you're playing with or what the child's playing with um, you can coach a family in how to say something like I'm gonna play detective and first look for clues then I'm going to write down those clues in my notebook. And if you're like, Christy, I work with toddlers. That's really big. Right. This is a level three outcome. So you might want to look at level one, and then the prompts will be more developmentally appropriate for young children. So here's another quick example. This one is also a level three, um, and it's asking a question instead of making a statement through self-talk. And this one is from the category of building my vocabulary. So anything you might be doing or a parent might be doing with their child. Now, this is also fabulous if you have in, uh, a family who's deployed or a family who has uh, a work schedule where they're not face-to-face -face with their child. These are things that they could easily ask or say um, through a Zoom or a Skype or phone call. It could be things that they think about doing so that next time they're together it comes out really naturally and you don't have to have the screen in front of you but you ask how might a friend feel when there aren't enough toys for everyone so some of you talked a little bit earlier about wanting to support sibling interactions so these could be absolutely things that help support interactions between siblings or cousins or kids that are playing together in the neighborhood last one uh, this one is uh, using a directive it's it's inviting a child to do something. So you say, let's practice taking deep and then shallow breaths. So this could be something that you see a child kind of getting escalated um, and a family say that, you know, that there's a certain time of day where the child kind of just loses it. You might encourage this little breathing where you just kind of distract the child and do really deep breaths and then really shallow breaths and that sort of distracts them from being escalated, but it also teaches them self-regulation. So you can um, download printables. So what we did was we took like 20 or 25 of the things that are on the screen if you have the educational app, and we just made them a printable. So Robin has shared the direct link but there's a whole podcast uh, podcast episode 7 where we talk more about um, using sort of this idea of creating embedded learning opportunities 
using power packs to teach self-regulation, and then we've given you the link to the printable starter packs. And that's just like 25 things that you can print off and post around your house or in your car. Again, that's your family's house, family's car. Um, you can put it on your computer screen. So if you're uh, the military family member that you want to have kind of your cheat sheet right there available to you. If you hear lots of shark music at a certain time of day and you want something to say other than yelling at your kid, right? There's all different kinds of ways that we can use this. But the idea is to use what we learned in those routines-based interviews and really use that information to then help support and guide children's development and learning in a very intentional way but in a very playful way. So before I revisit those three challenges and give you your final kind of suggestions for overcoming the challenges of creating ELOs, anybody have an idea about how maybe some of you have used them before or something like the power packs? So we have the printable ones that are in the columns that go along with the stories. We have the educational app that's on your mobile device and then we have the screenshots from your device that you can post around the environment. Anybody kind of have a question about them? Need us to tell you where to get one of those three things one more time? Anybody gonna, this is my takeaway, this is Christy, this is what I'm gonna do. This is how I'm gonna do it, this is who I'm gonna share it with. And I'm gonna just pause and let people type a little bit. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I've used them. Um, and it really depends, as um, Catherine even said, um, the adult that's your style, right, as an adult, and other people's style. So here's two kind of um, center-based or um, community-based ideas. And then I'll give you two ideas uh, for a more home-based. So uh, definitely for in a center-based or in a child care, um, having the adult use their morning meeting time by asking one of the questions or doing one of the things on the slide. That could also be during story time, really using the um, five steps to make sure that you intentionally teach what you wanted. It can also strengthen the homeschool connection by sharing ideas of what families can say, the same thing that the people are saying at school or in the childcare. So there's that kind of connection between what we're learning at school or in childcare and what families can then extend that learning. Um, definitely for family members can use them when they aren't sure what to say or do to scaffold and be intentional. So there might be family members who are very playful, very responsive, but may not feel like they're actually teaching something. It could actually be those IFSP outcomes that we should be coaching families to uh, address, but we might do it in a very simple way that shows them what to say, when to say it, and then makes that connection back to this is how we're really teaching all those important skills that your child will need down the road. All right? Yeah, so I'm just looking at what people say. Um, yeah, you could definitely do it as you prepare for a visit. You can actually do it as the visit. So I've done those on-home visits to create um, the ELOs um, together so that I'm not assuming when the family might want to create that beautiful match. Um, and that also lets me be responsive, especially for my military families who the situation might be changing in a more fluid way. I can create it, say, what's going on right now? Who's in the child's life? When does it make sense? Where can you come up for air? What's your priority right now? So we can create them on the fly. We can practice them on the visit. And then we have something tangible that's left behind uh, post the visit. And then it's something that I you can share with families, members that maybe live far away, even grandparents, so that they know what we're working on and can support when they interact with the child as well. Um, yeah, you're going to ask me to repeat the four categories, and I will always forget them, so I will try my best to remember. It's building my child's uh, vocabulary, 
It's exploring their environment. It's getting their wants and needs met. It's kind of like the big areas of language and literacy, uh, cognition, um, and I should know them off the top of my head. Um, I'll try to look at my app while I do that. And if Robin gets to it before me, um, she will tell you. But if not, I will tell you as soon as I look inside my app on my phone. Um, so the four, there's three levels, kind of toddlerhood up to early elementary. That's how the kind of the developmental span. Oh, here we go. I got it. Building my vocabulary. Navigating my space, that's the motor one I forgot, caring for myself, which is sort of that adaptive, and experiencing my world. So building my vocabulary, navigating my space, caring for myself, and experiencing my world. Those are the four categories, and then there are three levels, and then there are three evidence-based strategies that are built into the educational app. Okay. All right, guys. So let me kind of begin to wind us down, and if you haven't already, you want to be able to put something on your note uh, about what your, your takeaway is, what you're going to do, what you're going to put into action. So remember we said there were um, three reasons that the research shows us that people don't deliver embedded learning opportunities. One, they don't start with forming relationships. Two, they don't think about meaningful outcomes. And three, they don't see themselves as the guide on the side. So. How do we overcome them? What's the opposite of those sort of um, don't do's, right? So, of course, the first is to build relationships. And so my little quick takeaway for that is this screenshot that um, you can capture and um, think about these are 10 ways that we build relationships. These can be relationships with our pets. These can be relationships with our neighbors. These can be relationships with our uh, superiors, and then of course relationships with our families, and then of course relationships with families, uh, fam sorry, families with their children. And so Robin has just put the link to this image in the chat. Those of you who are watching it back, you can just take a screenshot real quick if you want. Um, these are the 10 essentials. And so anything that we do on this wheel is really forming relationships and just remembering that relationships really do matter before the step one, step two, step three, blah, blah, blah. Do we have calm? Uh, do we have calm? That's getting rid of the shark music. Have we sparked curiosity? My colleague Barb Avila always talks about curiosity to you. If we don't have curiosity, none of the rest of this matters. How do we scaffold and support? How do we be consistent? How do we be responsive? Again, this applies across our connections in um, being with, hum with each other's humans. So these are 10 essentials to building relationships. The second challenge or issue to doing ELOs was that we don't target meaningful outcomes. So, of course, what would be the opposite? <laughs> yes, target meaningful outcomes. But what does it mean to target meaningful outcomes? What do we really do and how do we do that? For me, uh, this is the one, Robin, for that new podcast about Goldilocks. Um, I just made a podcast the other day, episode 25, where I talk about this Goldilocks. Some of you who are big Vygotsky fans, you know that it as the zone of proximal development. And the idea of creating that true match when we create an embedded learning opportunity is that it is just right. It's not too big. It's not too small. It's not too hard. It's not too easy. It's not too loud. It's not too soft, right? It's just right. And so if you want to think more about what is just right, it's really about building on children's interests. And so we when we think about all these routines-based interviews and all these assessments we do and all these things, have we spent enough time paying attention to the interests of children and then in the interests of children within the context of their family? So that's how we get to targeting meaningful outcomes is we pay greater attention to the idea of children's interests. So this was a new addition, so it's not on your handout, but it's preKteachandplay.com forward slash podcast 25, and that was where I talk about 
um, this Goldilocks effect, this just right, this match, this building upon interest as being so necessary to creating embedded learning opportunities. And then lastly, before we wind down for this webinar and gear up for webinar number four, is we think about that third challenge about being a guide on the side, not a sage on the stage. And so clearly today, I have not modeled that, right? I have done everything to be a sage on the stage and nothing to be a guide on the side. But this idea of really supporting families, that's being a guide on the side, supporting children's development, again, creating that Goldilocks, that just right, that just in time, that just right now, um, and that fluidity to our interactions with families so that we can be responsive but that we really want to think about how do I um, guide through uh, using parallel talk or describing what children are doing versus always telling them what to do or asking them questions. How do I reflect or repeat back what they said versus asking another question? Though, if I am going to ask questions, let's ask some open-ended ones that aren't that yes, no, but really spark that curiosity that let them know that we hear them, that we see them, that we notice them, um, and that we are really encouraging them to consider possibilities, not always redirecting and not always trying to get to a certain answer. And so that leads us to our very last comment, is that sometimes kids will struggle. Sometimes kids, um, children, um, it's hard to form relationships with them. And we need to take time to create um, smaller opportunities. That We need to make um, greater scaffolding to slow down, to give a smaller bid for an interaction. We need to peel back maybe a little bit further. Maybe we didn't uncover just the right what for where the child is right now. So when you find yourself struggling uh, whether it be with a colleague, with a family, if they're struggling with a child, take a minute and just kind of slow down and say, have we peeled back enough? Have we gotten to what is really the essential outcome here? And have I slowed down enough to really notice why it is that you're struggling so that I can give you a bid that is the right match? that offering to interact and to learn and explore that is that Goldilocks, that is just right. So I hope that through all of that you have found that we've accomplished in pieces and parts our three objectives for today, which is to better understand that paradox between being intentional and really being playful and following children's interests to really strengthen how we use those daily routines, but to be dynamic and responsive to the whole child in the context of where their family is right now. And then to be that good play partner who can overcome those challenges, that play partner who can form and forge relationships first and foremost, that play partner who knows what is the right outcome for right now, and that play partner who knows how to guide you when you are struggling. And so what we'll do um, next is Robin will kind of bring closure to webinar three, and then we'll, of course, invite you to join us for our final one in December. All right. Thank you, Christy, for um, your time and your expertise today. I think that people have learned a great deal from what you've shared. Um, family Development Early Intervention is active on social media and has many ways that you can connect with us via Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Links to those will be posted in the chat pod and are also on this current slide. Uh, we hope that you will connect with us through those channels if you have not done so already. In addition, we would like to invite our MFLN service provider partners such as DOD, branch services, guard and reserve service partners providers and cooperative extension professionals to continue the discussion in our private and moderated LinkedIn group. Please click the link to join the group or send us an email. We look forward to hearing from you as well. 
As Christy mentioned, uh, please plan to join us for the final webinar in our 2017 series on play on December 7th at 11 a.m. Eastern. During this session, Christy will provide information on seven learning progressions that set the foundation for children's success in school and in life, recommended practices for what to do when children get stuck, and evidence-based strategies for helping them expand their play with objects will also be provided. And you can go to the link that Misty posted there um, to find out more or to register for the December webinar. Webinar participants that want to receive CE credits or who want proof that they participated in the training need to take an evaluation and post-test. That link will be provided for you in just a moment here in the chat. CE certificates of completion are automatically emailed to you on completion of the evaluation and post-test. This can sometimes take up to 24 to 48 hours, and sometimes it can take a little longer. It just depends on the system. Furthermore, some email providers will direct these CE certificates to your spam folder, so you'll want to check there too. If you don't receive a certificate within a few days after taking the evaluation and the post-test, however, and you've checked your spam folder to ensure it wasn't directed there, please email us at the email address that you will see on the screen in a moment, and we can help you obtain it. That address is mflnfdearlyintervention at gmail.com. Those claiming EI credit will need to check with their credentialing agency to determine if there are any additional materials you must submit to receive credit. Any of those materials you uh, might need are available on the Learn Event page, such as a copy of the slides. The email with your certificate will contain a copy of the post-test questions and your answers, and I know that some agencies will request that you submit that also. If you're in a state other than those that are listed on this current slide, some other states and professional licensure boards will recognize the CE credits we supply. If you're wondering if these credits will apply to your licensure or field, you would need to check with your state or professional licensure board. The link for the evaluation in the post-test is provided in the gray chat pod, and Misty will post it one more time for you there. It's also located on the slide before you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Please know that some participants need to copy and paste the link into their web browsers while others can just click on it directly in the chat or from the slide. Uh, please try both options if you have trouble with one. Additionally, this link will be posted as soon as we close out of here. This link to the post-test and evaluation will be posted on the Learn event um, for this, event, this uh, webinar, which is right in that important info pod below the um, slide. In addition to the Family Development Early Intervention Team, the Military Families Learning Network consists of several other concentration areas that provide resources and or professional development for the individual working with military families. These include military caregiving, personal finance, family transitions, nutrition and wellness, community capacity building, and network literacy. More information about these areas and what they have to offer can be found at the link on the slide or in the chat. Thank you all so much for attending today and for your interaction. We hope that you've gained knowledge that will be helpful to you in your field and in your practice. We'll keep the webinar room open for a few more minutes. If you have any questions regarding the presentation or CE credits or would like to keep today's conversation going, you can connect with us on the social media outlets or send an email to us at the email that is in the chat now, mflnfd earlyintervention at gmail.com. We are so glad you were here. We are so thankful for your participation, and we hope to see you at our final webinar for 2017 on December 7th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much, Robin. I do want to re reiterate Robin's thanks to Christy for sharing her expertise today, and thank you all who contributed to our conversations and asked questions as well. We know that there are a number of links you may uh, need to collect from the chat pod, so we'll leave this room open for another couple minutes in case you need to do so. If you're headed out, thank you again for joining us today. We're so happy that you tuned in. Uh, just note that we will be posting the recording of today's session to the learn.extension.org URL uh, here in the next day or two in case you would like to review or to share with any colleagues or uh, affiliates who might be interested. Also note the other two 
sessions that we have uh, experienced with Christy are linked on the sidebar, uh, but we'll also post those uh, links here in the chat pod in just a second in case you want to check those out. So, ah, good deal. Uh, Christy says that she is also available to stick around for a couple of minutes here in case anyone needs clarification on any points before we officially wrap things up. Thanks, Christy. All right, I'm not seeing any additional comments or questions in the chat pod, so we'll give you another few moments or so to finish collecting any URLs. If you think of any follow-up questions or have uh, yeah, follow-up questions, uh, you can, of course, email us at milfamellen at gmail.com, uh, and we will forward or respond uh, as needed. So thank you again, Christy, so much for your expertise today and for your time. And thank you, everyone, who contributed, like I said, to our conversation. We're so happy that you joined us. Wishing you a wonderful rest of your week, great weekend, and we hope to see you again in December for the fourth webinar in our series with Christy Pretty Fraldsack.